And now we'll go to the, um, the year 1870, actually, because it was in the year 1870 that still another society was formed. Because the previous society, the, uh, the so-called Revolt of the 14th, and their association was felt insufficient. And uh, another society was formed and it will be called the Society for the Wandering Art Exhibits. The, or they are called the Wanderers, or in Russian they are called Peredvizhniki. And the reason they were called uh, the Wanderers because these young men, they felt that they need to take their art and they, have, and they need to take their ideas to the people. And uh, this also coincided with the desire of the uh, intellectuals in large cities to go to the countryside and to share their progressive ideas with the people in the countryside and uh, perhaps stir them to uh, uprisings. Well, that failed. But the Peredvizhniki themselves, the wanderers, did create uh, quite extraordinary art. In a way, they wished to uh, perpetrate a, a social crusade uh, serving the democratic ideas and uh, do everything in the interests of uh, society. They had uh, three, major, three major tasks and uh, was realism, uh, populism, but also nat national character. And the way they were organized was that uh, each artist now was his own man, so to speak, so they did not have to share profits and uh, each man did uh, went into the people showed his work uh, as part of the um, uh, of the group exhibitions but if he happens to sell more paintings than another man uh, he was not obliged to share and um, actually all the most brilliant uh, men and then later women of the time joined the group and because the group existed until the end of the century, until the end of the 19th century. But um, their program of, uh, of social service sometimes could also be somewhat uh, limiting and as a, result, as a result a number of artists uh, uh, in a way lost their way uh, by joining the group but then they found it later on anyway. Um, the uh, one of the very important uh, men of the group was uh, Ivan Kramskoy and uh, this is uh, his portrait by Ilya Repin. Repin will be the uh, most recognized member of uh, the Peredvizhniki group. Uh, portrayed the many-sided uh, aspects of social life, often uh, critical, but not as critical as in the 60s, as Pirov, for instance, because here and now they were looking also for a hero. And they also wished to go back almost uh, to uh, Vigitsyanov, sort of um, uh, art in a sense of portraying the positive aspects of Russian life not only the negative. So the art showed not only the poverty but also the beauty of the folk way of life. They did condemn the autocratic government uh, in their art, which was humanistic art. And the blossoming, the 20 years of blossoming between 1870 and 1890, uh, the society developed a wider scope and as more painters joined than the wider the scope uh, was. They worked for naturalness in their images and the depiction of people's relationship with uh, their surroundings and they aimed for veritableness, so to speak, and not as with Pirov, not to convey their own uh, attitude to what they were seeing, but just to show it perhaps independently. Uh, Ivan Kramskoy, as I said, was a, absolutely a brilliant uh, portraitist as well. I love this uh, portrait of Mina Moisev. Well, by now he was uh, freed, he was no longer a serf. And um, he worked with horses, and uh, here we see the horse's gear. Uh, and he was a man of the people, and in portraying him, he also 
he almost sort of conveys one of the Tolstoy uh, heroes, uh, the uh, people in Tolstoy novels, full of wisdom, full of humor, full of understanding, full of beauty, full of beauty and the um, experience of life. Sort of the face that when one when people say today even uh, that one has uh, a face one is granted. Uh, by God until one is what, what, 30 or so, and then after 45 one has a face one deserved. Uh, so here is an absolutely delightful face that, that this man clearly deserved, and Kramskoy conveyed it just brilliantly. Uh, he also painted the, uh, the great men of his time. Uh, here is Pavel Tritsyakov, the art patron, after whom and his brother the gallery is named in Moscow. And Taras Shevchenko, he's a Ukrainian poet and uh, is portrayed here in, uh, in his lamb hat and lamb color that he always wore. And then Lev Tolstoy, uh, they became friendly in fact, and Kravinskoy painted this in uh, the estate of, uh, of Lev Tolstoy in the Yasnaya Poliana. And Tolstoy, in fact, observed uh, Kramskoy in his own uh, turn. And the painter Mikhalkov in Anna Karenina describes uh, Kramskoy. That's Kramskoy as Tolstoy depicts him. Uh, he was just brilliant with the eyes also. He just conveyed the incredible intelligence in all these people and penetration and their ability to judge humanity. Really just beautiful. Uh, here, speaking of the eyes, here is a forester and his eyes are very, very intense as he is looking from uh, under his cap and the cap seems to, to have been uh, hit by bullets right there. And another painter of the time, Alexander Litovchenko, and while these eyes are light blue and very intense, so are these. So these, if these are Tolstoy eyes, as he describes them, these are more, this is more of a Dostoevsky character, shall we say. And then he painted Christ in a desert, which is probably his most famous painting, and um, he depicts him at the cross, crossroads. Uh, uh, it is the temptation of Christ, and uh, in this painting, it's almost as if, in fact, uh, Kramskoy wrote to one of his friends that what he depicts is himself at the crossroads. He feels that every man, or woman for that matter, uh, at a certain point in our lives we come to the crossroads where we have to choose between perhaps vice and virtue. And it's a very challenging task. Uh, and, well, essentially it goes back to classical antiquity uh, with uh, Hercules, when Hercules was, uh, when a young Hercules was met uh, on the road, uh, at, at the crossroads. He was met by uh, two women, and one was the personification of vice, and the other was the personification of virtue, and uh, the Renaissance and later painters uh, all painted the episodes and uh, loved painting these episodes, which to choose, because, uh, well, the personification of pleasure or vice uh, is usually painted as this beautiful, voluptuous woman with golden hair, uh, whereas uh, the personification of vice is usually simply dressed and no jewelry and uh, rather stark. Um, so the, uh, the choice is very important. Well, in a way, this Christ in a desert is uh, the same type of painting as the man sits in this uh, utter desert, uh, having to choose between uh, good and, uh, and bad, between vice and virtue. Um, Kramskoy drops the horizon line very low, so that the figure, the triangle of Christ, in fact, is, appears to be monumental. And even though there's nothing monumental about the figure itself, but the idea of the choice is there. And uh, it seems that uh, this seems to be a sunrise, this seems to be very, very early morning, and uh, with the hope rising. Uh, the desert is portrayed uh, as, uh, well, as a desert, uh, very colorless and uh, 
Christ's face is all concentrated on this inner conflict. Really a brilliant painting. Uh, he, oh, here, Kramskoy wrote to the question, how do you know what Christ looked like? I permitted myself to reply, but even the actual living Christ was not recognized. He also, in one of his historical paintings, uh, painted uh, Herodias, and this too is a very ancient theme, and usually this theme is portrayed as the dance of Salome. Here, for instance, we go to the 15th century. It's Donatello's Feast of Herod, and the story is Herod is married to Herodias, who is uh, a relative of sorts, and so he was not supposed to marry her. And uh, as a result, John the Baptist condemned the marriage, and Herodias was unhappy with him. And even when Herod arrested him, but was unwilling to execute him, it was Herodias who talked to her daughter Salome, uh, who was a beautiful dancer, a wonderful dancer, and she asked her to dance at the next feast because Herod would be charmed. Uh, Salome danced at the feast, and Herod was indeed so charmed that he promised her anything she wanted, and she wanted the head of John the Baptist. And that's how traditionally the scene was portrayed. And here we have the feast, and here's Herod, Herodias, and uh, the, usually the servant already brings the head of John the Baptist, because now that Herod promised Salome that he would execute uh, the Baptist, he had to do so. So the head is brought to him, and different stages of horror usually are depicted. And here's still another, also from the 15th century, a little later, uh, by Fra Filippo Lippi, and it's the same thing. But here, in fact, uh, Salome is shown as dancing. This is a narrative painting, and uh, it consists of several scenes, and Herod and Herodia are sitting there, Salome is dancing. Here, Salome herself is holding a tray as she is accepting the head of John the Baptist, and here she is presenting the tray to Herodias, and here are, again, various stages of horror. The man, the first man who did a very unusual presentation of the scene was Caravaggio in the early 17th century, when instead of presenting the uh, Feast of Herod or the Dance of Salome, he actually shows us the execution that takes place in, uh, in jail. And here we have it, and here is John the Baptist as he, he is being executed and as his head is being cut off. So that is a very unusual uh, representation for the times. Uh, still another brilliant representation on the same theme, as I said, this theme was very popular, is Gustave Moreau in, uh, in the 19th century, and uh, he was a symbolist, and this is Salome's dance, and he approaches this theme uh, in many, many, many cases. He, he did, what, 19 paintings, six watercolors, and more than 150 drawings on the theme. And here, Salome has a vision of uh, John the Baptist, of the head of John the Baptist, while she dances. And still another one is Aubrey Beardsley, right here at the very end of the 19th century, as he did illustrations for uh, Oscar Wilde's Salome. Um, the idea of a wicked uh, vixen, as opposed to another idea that men held of women, and that is a virgin. So it's either, either a femme fatale or a virgin, and Salon was seen as the femme fatale. And here is Herodias by Kramskoy, right here, and it's still a different approach. Even now, perhaps, uh, closer to Moho. Uh, the head is there, and uh, Herodias here, not Salome, in this case it's Herodias herself, who is uh, looking at the head and as if having a conversation with the head. One of truly extraordinary, remarkable painters, who was uh, a part of the uh, Pirit Vizhniki, of the Wanderers. 
but who in fact wondered of his, uh, um, of his road uh, when he joined them. And he will find himself only later on when uh, he will go again independently. Well, the artist is uh, Nicolai Gay. Uh, comes from French background and his ancestral surname was De Gay and uh, well in Russian he is Nikolai Gay. Uh, he was in a way sort of a symbolist uh, of, uh, of really extraordinary inner vision. This is his self-portrait and this is his uh, portrait by another artist and it's in the Tritsikov gallery. Uh, very early on, before he even joined the, uh, the Wanderers, he painted this rather astonishing uh, painting of the Last Supper. And, well, the Last Supper also was traditionally painted uh, with uh, all the apostles on one side of the table, with Judas on our side of the table. And then uh, Leonardo, of course, changed that and he plays Judas also on the other side of uh, the table. Well, this is still another interpretation and that is by Gay. He shows them on the upper story of a building in Jerusalem, having their supper and clearly having had an argument. It's not just the moment uh, which was a traditional depiction of the Last Supper where Christ announces the fact that one of the disciples will betray him. Here it seems that they have had an argument, in fact, uh, and uh, as a result of this argument, uh, Judas is leaving the, uh, the room. Here it is in black and white, perhaps um, one can see it better here than actually in a colored illustration, because we see Judas, here's his face right here, and his right elbow is lifted as if but his hand is trying to catch his scarf that is behind his back and uh, the uh, face is darkened, he is upset. He is leaving the room while Christ is lost in uh, his own thoughts and all the other apostles. This, this is uh, Saint John the youngest. Uh, all the other apostles either discuss what has just happened between uh, each other or looking at uh, at uh, Judas. And uh, the interesting point here is that Judas, according to an apocryphal story, which makes perfect sense, was in fact the favorite disciple and that uh, Christ knew that somebody had to do it, that in order for him indeed to expiate humanity's sins, uh, he has to be condemned and he has to be crucified and somebody has to betray him and uh, there is no one, no one in his company of apostles that he knows would do it except the one who believes him, who loves him unquestioningly, who loves him entirely and who would do absolutely anything and everything for him and that is Judas and that uh, Christ in fact gives him this impossible task that Judas accepts because uh, they both know that while Christ will be crucified, he will become a god and he will well, save humanity, while Judas uh, will be condemned for the rest of um, eternity. And that at the end of which Judas, in fact, uh, flings the 30 silver pieces away from him and then commits suicide by disemboweling himself and by hanging himself and there are a number of uh, uh, paintings that portray uh, this element uh, and it seems almost as if uh, Gay is uh, familiar with it and uh, and that Judas was part of the group but uh, and perhaps uh, he was charged with this task while the dinner went on and that all the apostles are horrified and uh, he is leaving the room knowing what he has to do. Possible, who knows what uh, went on in the artist's head, but it is extremely compelling, the painting. He, he throws these incredible shadows on the wall. Judas himself 
covers the source of light. It's almost Karavajesk in a way. He covers the source of light, it's behind him, and which is why uh, it is difficult to see his face, it's difficult to see his form, but then that source of light also casts these enormous shadows, um, foreboding shadows on the wall. And here, perhaps you can see it here better. Uh, yes, because in the colored painting we can't even see this uh, person here where here he is of this. Uh, so really an amazing painting and that's where Gay was heading, even as a younger man. Uh, and then, as I said, he wandered off the road when he joined uh, the Piridvizhniki. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, at some point he will just stop painting altogether because uh, he, uh, he will be confused. He, on the one hand, he will want to embrace the uh, the social realism that Peredvizhniki um, put forth, but at the same time uh, his, uh, his soul uh, demanded a different kind of painting of him. And he will return to it towards uh, when he, not that he will leave Peredvizhniki, but when Peredvizhniki will soften uh, their demands on their painters. And so the painters could in fact find themselves. Oh, here is uh, Andrea del Castaño, the Last Supper, again, 15th century, and this was a very typical Last Supper. Uh, the uh, Apostles on the one side, Judas on the other side. And then he brought Judas on the other side. Here he is, the shadow doesn't fall on him, and, uh, but then uh, Gay will do his own. Uh, when he joins the Peredvizhniki, Peredvizhniki, uh, as I said, they, they wished to portray a hero. They wished to find a hero. And, uh, well, while Ivan the Terrible was a negative hero, a horrible man, uh, and he was portrayed a number of times by the painters, now they found a positive hero, and that was Peter the Great, who, in fact, was not much better. Uh, than Ivan the Terrible in terms of his treatment of his people. And uh, uh, for about 300 years ago, on November 21, uh, 1716, uh, Tsarevich Alexei, who was weak and uh, he, uh, he was distanced from his uh, father's views, he um, he went to Austria and there with him went one of his serfs, a woman with whom he, he didn't marry her, but they, um, it was sort of a, a common law uh, marriage. And then he asked Austria for an asylum, but Austria did not grant it uh, because Peter threatened. Uh, and then Peter wrote to him, inviting him back to Russia, promising him that he'll be nice to him. But, well, um, he wasn't. He ultimately was for forced into prison where he was tortured and uh, where he ultimately died. Here I found another uh, image that shows it a little better. Uh, now, Peter the Great uh, was famous not only for his reforms and his um, modernization uh, of Russia, and, of course, the construction of the new capital, but also for his temper. And he was just as terrifying as Ivan the Terrible was. And, uh, and he could execute people on the spot. Uh, obviously, he was an autocrat. Uh, there, was, uh, there was no judge above him. Not only was he capable of beating anyone who irritated him and beating them to death, he could also have them executed. Everyone was afraid of falling out of favor uh, with Peter, and that included his own family. And here, and the one person who was always out of favor with Peter was his eldest son, uh, Alexei Alexis, who was born in 1690. And uh, for the first uh, 19 years, he lived in Moscow, not in St. Petersburg, away from his father and surrounded by the uh, nobility, by the boyars who certainly did not approve of all the reforms of uh, Peter's. And, um, and, well, he grew up skeptical of the same reforms. Uh, according to the Tsar, uh, Alexei could never do anything right, and whatever the Tsar asked him to do 
according to the Tsar, he always did wrong. And uh, not only he expressed his displeasure to the son, called him all sorts of names, uh, such as stupid and inept, but he also presumably beat him with a stick. So one can imagine that the boy was not growing up uh, very happy, and as a result of which he in fact escaped Russia with the, uh, with the female serf, and uh, he reached Italy, and he traveled around Europe, and then he asked for asylum in Austria, which was not granted. Meanwhile, Peter sent uh, an, uh, an ambassador to Alexei, asking him to come back. And as I said, you know what happened. Uh, Nikolai Gay is painting this, um, this work uh, as uh, Peter interrogating uh, his son. And Peter here is shown as noble and as charitable while his son is in fact shown small and uh, thin and inept and uh, well this was in the uh, interests of uh, the wanderers and within the program of the wanderers but uh, but Nikolai Ge did all in his abilities to research the circumstances and uh, to place uh, the scene in one of the rooms uh, true to life uh, with the uh, floor and with the oriental carpets and even the art on the walls. Uh, the, but as I said, Peter is shown almost as benevolent, uh, ready to forgive, while Alexei here is shown as regretful and, uh, uh, and contrite. Whether this was the case, we don't know. And then, as I said, uh, later on, uh, later in the century, he returned uh, to the themes that were dear to his heart, and those themes were themes of Christianity and uh, religious themes. And here he paints uh, two paintings. One is uh, uh, Pilate and Christ, as Pilate asks the question, uh, what is truth? And the second one is Golgotha, or Cavalry. And uh, in uh, this painting we see two men, one of course is well-dressed and, uh, um, and secure in life, the other one is a prisoner about to be executed, and yet the way Ge conveys it, uh, while Pilate asks this question, what is the truth, that he doesn't know the answer to, uh, there's Christ who is imprisoned, who is hungry, who is beaten, he knows the answer, but he knows that also that uh, uh, it's not possible to convince the other man of what he knows, and therefore uh, it, it's futile. And in a way, with Gay, his paintings now are sort of the uh, expressions of uh, his own feelings, of uh, uh, his own questions about the suffering, the earning, the doubt, death, and he spills it onto the canvases, whereas, as I said, the wanderers demanded less of a personal um, uh, attitude towards painting and more of a remote observation. And then the next year we only see a hand, uh, an arm, that uh, points to Christ from the right, we don't know, whose that um, arm is, possibly Caiaphas, the high priest of the temple, uh, because one sometimes thinks of the um, case of Judas uh, by Giotto, uh, a painter of the early 14th century, a large fresco where Caiaphas stands on the side and also with his hand points at Christ, so possibly Caiaphas. But here we see Christ understanding what is going to happen and uh, not even so much horrified by his own fate as by the fate of uh, those uh, for whom he, uh, he is about to die. Um, Ge was very influenced by Tolstoy and uh, made sure to get in touch with Tolstoy to introduce himself to him and the two of them became great friends forever and ever. Uh, so, the, uh, so this is Galgofa. And then finally then, still the next painting is that of uh, uh, crucifixion, which is also a very unusual painting. And uh, 
in his writing, he in fact says uh, to someone, he writes that, I want them to howl as they look at my painting. I want them to feel as Christ feels rather than um, rather than uh, just sigh gently. I want all the emotions out. And here it is. Visually, um, one of the most interesting aspects uh, of the painting, apart from the unflinching honesty towards human suffering, is that um, yet chose to represent the darkening sky. And as we know, according to scriptures, the sky darkened, and but then once he died, the sky, then the, the storm passed. And very many people represent the darkening sky or a couple of clouds, mostly clouds. Here, it's all black. The, com the, the, the whole background is entirely black. And as a result, it creates this startlingly graphic composition next to a very strongly illuminated foreground, very dramatic. Again, sort of Caravagesque in but on Ge's own terms. The, uh, the chiaroscuro, the, uh, the light and dark here, are created with incredible uh, dramaticism. And interestingly also, he also uh, paints the uh, crucifixion correctly because in the majority of cases we see crucifixion through the hands because that's where the stigmata falls. It's the hands, the feet, and the right side of Christ, whereas it would not have been possible uh, because the hands would be torn if people were crucified through the hands. So the people were crucified, in fact, through the wrists and then often, in fact, tied up to the cross. And uh, in this case, uh, we don't see the, the, the tying up, but we de do see crucifixion through the wrists and the utter agony of uh, pain. All of that is, I mean, this is expressionism and it's uh, most horrific. Uh, the last time such expression was seen was back in the 16th century and the crucifixion that was painted by uh, Matthias Grunwald. Uh, he painted uh, this crucifixion for a hospital for the plague victims and uh, so what he did now with Christ, he made Christ a plague victim and his entire body is covered in sores but so that the victims could see their Savior and know that they're not alone in their suffering. The most uh, renowned painter of the wonders is um, Ilya Repin, and here he is, and uh, he is the one that went all over Russia painting the scenes of Russian life. Still as a young man in the academy, he painted, uh, and it took him three years, he painted the barge haulers on the Volga. And for this, he in fact went to the Volga. He uh, uh, got to know a number of the uh, barge haulers. Each one of them is a real person. Each one of them has a name. Uh, and when he created this painting, he did not want it to be localized. He wanted to represent a universal suffering of humanity, the universal suffering of uh, the folk uh, that spend their life holding the life of the better placed humanity. And uh, he sort of does the same as Leonardo did in the Last Supper, grouping people together. And we see uh, here, here's a group of three and then another group of three and still another group, more than three. Uh, there are 11 people all together here, so it's nine and two. And uh, different characters from different walks of life are represented. Uh, there's, uh, there's a Greek, there's a Kalnik, there's a Russian uh, from different ethnicities, Russian ethnicities. Uh, there are people who have given up entirely, such as this man here. Uh, there are other people who are shown as understanding what is happening. Uh, the young boy here is uh, sort of represented in a heroical uh, attitude as if struggling against, uh, against the belt. 
there is still there is another here with a pipe. So these groups, uh, he did them around a taller figure, right here, and thus he uh, just shows uh, the general suffering as opposed to local suffering. But these, this was a very common occurrence uh, along the rivers. Here are the women who are the holders, and this is this is a photograph. And then one of his greatest uh, canvases is the religious uh, procession in, um, in, in Kursk. And it's an Easter procession. It's the same thing that Petrov uh, did before, but now uh, he, uh, Repin, wants to, to depict humanity at large. And here he does the same thing as he had done before. There are all sorts of different uh, social classes. Um, there is a hunchback with a friend who are devout Christians, and then uh, there are the choristers who go there singing, and there are the wealthy, and then here is a priest in his very rich robes who looks fat and mindless, and then above all else, above all else, are the gendarmes and uh, the police. Here is someone who is beating someone in the crowd and then on the left uh, of the painting there is this great juxtaposition of the gendarme who is sitting uh, on his horse uh, and even though he's clearly moving he looks uh, as an unmovable Russia that uh, despite reforms goes nowhere and uh, he is juxtaposed against the sincere expression of faith uh, right here. Well, this painting uh, can really be looked at for hours because everybody there is a character. And it's huge, it's enormous. And uh, here is the priest, as you see here, and in his rich robes, sort of looking askance at us with his enormous stomach and uh, a woman who is holding an icon also with this uh, very impenetrable, uh, unintelligent face. And then on the other hand, uh, there are some peasant women who are holding a box, perhaps with a relic. So that's Repin. And then we saw this, and this is one of the uh, historical painting paintings, and that's Ivan the Terrible killing his uh, son Ivan. I mean, they, uh, they killed their sons, Peter the Great killed his, and before that Ivan the Terrible uh, killed his son. And Repin positions him right there in the middle of the room, uh, uh, surrounded, sitting on a red carpet. Uh, blood is streaming out of uh, his son's uh, head uh, as Ivan is mad, and but trying to stay the blood, uh, but everything is red, the painting is red, and even though there's not much furniture, uh, just those mad eyes of the father and completely open eyes of, uh, of the son who is dying and the redness everywhere conveys the horror. He also paints this delightful painting of the Kazaki writing a letter to a sultan, the Ottoman sultan, and these are the Kazaki on the Don River. Uh, here it is, it's the reply of the Zaporozhian Kazaki. Zaporozhne means beyond the rapids, that's where they lived, his Kazaki. And so reply of the Kazakhs uh, depicts a supposedly historical anecdote set in um, late 17th century where the, uh, the Sultan sent some uh, um, sent his army to Kazaki, the Kazaki presumably defeated the army, they did not wish to, uh, to be uh, the subjects of the, uh, of the Sultan. Uh, so the Sultan wrote them the letter, uh, even though the Sultan was defeated, he still uh, writes the letter listing all the advantages Kazaki would have if uh, they became his subjects. And then Kazaki uh, writing a reply which is full of insults and obscenities and having a great merry time at it. And here's what he depicts. This became a prototype for lots and lots of uh, uh, comical uh, paintings later on uh, in Russian history. Who's writing letters to whom? 
uh, but uh, again, every single person is depicted brilliantly. Still another painter who really became a great historical painter and that is Vasily Surikov. And he also was fascinated by the Kazakhs, uh, of Cossacks. And here is another one, Sjok Karazin or Stein Karazin, uh, as he is sailing the uh, Caspian Sea. He too is a personage of the 17th century and uh, the Cossacks were free companies of men who lived on the Volga, on the Don, a lot of peasants, a lot of uh, the serfs because the, uh, the serfs were becoming more and more attached to the land. They, many of them ran away and joined the Cossacks and they always presented this very romantic vision. So, and here's Surikov uh, showing uh, Stepan Razin, who in fact, uh, who led his uh, Cossacks against the Russian Empire on the perimeter. Well, that, uh, that ended in his death, but here he is on the Caspian Sea and he is shown as thinking to himself as, uh, as a great strategist, but mostly a very romantic character. Uh, here he is, Surikov, and here he is uh, when he is young and uh, uh, when he is older. And he, in fact, identified himself as a Cossack by ancestry. Uh, he grew up on the margin of the Russian Empire in Siberia. And thus he painted Ryzen uh, on the Caspian Sea and realistically neither as a hero nor as a villain, because obviously, depending on wh whom one asked, uh, he was either a hero or a villain. Uh, we saw this painting, and that is the painting of uh, the Bayarinya Marozova, who was uh, the adherent of the old believers. And uh, this too is an enormous canvas, with, painted with great attention to individual faces, and painted with um, isocephaly in mind. Isocephaly is uh, a principle of uh, painting a large group of people but with their heads on the same level. And this principle was discovered by the ancient Greeks and then the Renaissance rediscovered it. Uh, one of the great examples is uh, Masaccio's uh, tribute money that Masaccio painted in the early 15th century. Another great example is uh, from the 6th century AD and that is Emperor Justinian uh, uh, and that's in San Vitale in Ravenna, it's a mosaic. But, uh, uh, but neither one nor the other uh, has as many uh, people as Surikov has here. Uh, but the central point is Marozova's those two fingers of the old believers. But then various people react uh, differently uh, here is a girl who is crying, others express horror, they are all dressed in traditional costumes. He researched it brilliantly. Here we see our Yorodzevi, our God's man who is supporting Marozova as she is driven on the, on the Russian sledge to prison. Uh, a boy is running next to her, some people laugh, others are horrified. Um, a very Russian painting. Uh, the one I love personally very much and that's the one that he paints of a great uh, um, the Russian generalissimo, Count Suvorov, uh, who was a Russian field marshal during Napoleonic Wars and at one point uh, during the uh, uh, he commanded the Russo-Austrian force in Italy and then at one point he was commanded to relieve the Russian troops in Switzerland and he very famously marched across the Alps. Well, Surikov in fact went to Switzerland and climbed the mountains and he went there in the winter and he slided down the Alps just to feel, uh, just to see how it feels because as he will say, this painting is about movement but it's also about camaraderie. And here the whole troop is sliding down the mountain together with the, uh, uh, with the cannon. There's Suvorov himself, uh, whom uh, men loved, who, was, who always was one of the men and uh, 
uh, and enjoyed a great reputation with his men. And here are some of the uh, close-ups. It's really a great painting. And here, this is the sketch of, Sobor uh, of Soborov because Surikov did a lot of sketches. And uh, here are Soborov and the soldier looking at one another and uh, laughing together, which uh, again shows this great camaraderie that this uh, great man um, earned with his men. Still another painter who painted the great Russian uh, scenes, and that is uh, Viktor Vasnitsov. He did a lot of uh, painting of the Russian ballads and Russian fairy tales. And here he shows the three kind of stock characters of uh, the Russian fairy tales, Dabrinya Nikitich, Ilya Muromets, and Alyosha Popovich. And the one in the middle is Ilya Muromets, who was the great uh, the man of stability, the man of leadership. And then uh, on his right is Dabrinya Nikitich, who was very impulsive, and he does the same thing with the men and with the horses. And then Alyosha Popovich, who was the youngest, but uh, he preferred to, uh, to do things uh, surreptitiously, and uh, he's shown as such. We also saw a painting by Berish Chagin. This is all the group of people who painted at the time. And uh, very quickly I'll just show you a couple of landscapes, because Russian landscapes are lovely. And here is one by Savrasov. It is the rooks have come back, and because the Russian winter is can be so severe, especially in the north, the time March, middle of March to the beginning of April, when the snows begin to melt and the birds come back, the rooks in particular, is really a time of great happiness and uh, the great renewal, both moral and uh, natural, and this painting truly conveys it with the with the snows melting and the uh, the water running and the trees uh, still uh, still without their leaves but the rooks are there uh, another one Ivan Shishkin who was uh, uh, a forest czar essentially the titan of the russian forest no one could paint a forest as Shishkin could paint it. And this is his most famous painting, even though the bears were painted in by Konstantin Savitsky, but Shishkin painted the forest itself. And uh, actually a candy wrapper was done with this painting. So, and candy is very famous in Russia as well. Everybody knows this painting. Uh, still a very, a very renowned Russian painter, a Jewish painter, who benefited by the reforms and could come to St. Petersburg and enroll in the academy. And uh, he did sort of very lyrical landscapes, such as you see here, the evening bells. And then one of the greatest of them all, with his own vision, and uh, he is uh, Arhip Kuinji, was of Greek origin, um, and he joined the Wanderers, but was always kind of the margin of the Wanderers because he had his own vision and he'll stay with his own vision. His light is just mystical. It's extraordinary. Um, he did not necessarily paint from nature. Sometimes he did, but then he also, he saw nature, but then painted from memory uh, in his studio, injecting nature with his own mystical qualities. And uh, here is moonlit night on the deeper, and you see here too, just the whole thing is drowned in darkness, and uh, it's it's as if uh, uh, this is the beginning of creation with the moon lightening up uh, the earth. Uh, and he did a number of birch groves, but this is what I mean by his sort of mystical light. Everything is divided into uh, into registers, but all the registers intersect with one another and this mystical light penetrates everywhere. Thank you very much and goodbye.